Good day, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, module eight. Uh, this is for week eight of the course. A few weeks to go. This is an interesting module uh, on uh, computational resources that we need to process uh, the information that we generate. Um, right now, you know that there is um, a process of uh, handling um, experiments in, bi in bioinformatics. Uh, things start uh, in the lab uh, with the biotechnicians and other experts as they set up the experiment, and then data starts coming out. Uh, we know different technologies produces different types of data. For example, Trans transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, genomics are names of different subfields in bioinformatics, each one having specific technologies uh, or machines. Sometimes the machine overlaps between some of these areas. And they're just an example. There are there are more areas of interest. So once the technology is built and designed, it's now in the hands of experts to start generating uh, data based on a specific uh, um, interest or question or hypothesis. So now the data is coming out and here you are as a bioinformatician, you need to jump in and start processing. Yet, how do you do the processing? We understand we need computational resources. So a good question is going to be, is your own personal computer going to be sufficient or do you need more resources? From the title of this slide, which is high performance computing, remote computing containers and pipelines, I can tell you that generally it is very useful and helpful to have access to uh, you know, powerful resources as you do in this course such as accessing that discovery a cluster. And I believe this puts you at an advantage as a student of bioinformatics to have the chance to access such very valuable uh, resources and gives you the training. It's not always about some of the students are, uh, you know, raising this question, you know, do I need to use discovery for my project? Well, by the day, what I'm concerned with when it comes to the project is to have this practice of reproducing some results. If you need discovery or not, is no problem. I'm not going to grade you or mark you if you have used a discovery. But please appreciate the fact that you can access some resource and give yourself the chance to train a little bit with the shell. So working with uh, examples, uh, class exercises that we had before, and maybe we'll have later, is very important to be done. Also, trying to have your project run on this also is gonna, uh, you know, expose you to some uh, very good training. It is certainly a skill that I personally found very useful when I had the chance as being a master's or PhD student to get access to a full dedicated cluster in our center. And then once I finished, landed in my postdoc position, guess what? They did not have their own cluster. So I had to jump in and I had a very good chance to actually lead uh, uh, things starting from server purchasing, server installation, till uh, up to visiting the data center, doing the installations, putting the operating system, and start making that uh, server or node or cluster useful for the whole team. So I already started the story, very excited about this lecture and the ideas it's gonna visit. This is gonna be mostly on uh, bringing your attention, attention to some ideas to make it less awkward for you when you deal with people from a uh, data center when you are uh, you know, required to go and access some cluster and do some uh, evaluation. So in this lecture or module, we're gonna discover what is high performance computing 
And again, it's more from an abstract overview uh, because apparently in computer science, as you would imagine, we have courses that we teach an operating system on high performance computing. This is usually the uh, content for one full semester and um, networks and so on and so forth. All of these overlapping areas together, parallel computing and how to run parallel codes and make use of more resources. We certainly discover, look, look into discovery storage, something I highlighted uh, before when I uh, showed the tutorial into accessing the discovery. What is Bash and SRUN again? Containerization technology. And this is going to be from now on, as we see around us, the standard way of processing or uh, running programs, uh, containerization or Docker images, pipelines, and then we look into the group activity. So, on this module, Luna, try to know and understand and explain what is high performance computing? Why do we care as bioinformaticians? And then look into different related uh, concepts such as containerization and pipelines and tools and this whole thing on storage, computing and uh, memory. So why would we be interested in learning about this because as a bioinformatician you are required to have a wide range of tools it's something lately now whenever we have the justification slide i remind you about your own tool box okay so every one of us is having this own tool his own or her own tool box so that is that is where you put the tools and then you jump into challenges and have confidence because part of you know being more skilled is you go and actually start taking the challenges sometimes one would be hesitant to go and solve some problem or challenge but again if you want to get skilled you need to take this step and Sometimes you would make mistakes, but you would learn uh, in a very good way, especially in this domain of bioinformatics. Never I've met a person in this field who all understands uh, everything in the field. Always they are specialized in one area or so. Never. Okay, so which means collaboration is key which means that, you know, try to have a unique set of still skills. The toolbox is going to have tools. These are the skills that you're going to list in your resumes. But more, I would hope that you list something interesting in the projects part of your resume, something to bring discussion with the future employer or opportunities or your current employer. One of these tasks or tools is being able to work with uh, clusters, high performance computing, and so on and so forth. So really referring to this discovery thing can be significant in your resume, meaning you know the discovery cluster and that you can access uh, Linux operating systems, you can use the shell and run some programs and build some pipelines is going to be set of skills everyone is looking for in any bioinformatics resume. So for us, high performance computing, we require to perform certain tasks and deal uh, with some big data sets containing millions of read sequences or data points, which means it's going to end up most probably with billions of computations. We need to have access to some extensive resources. Let me remind you about tasks such as uh, alignment or de novo genome assembly. Those are uh, intensive tasks. 
sometimes it is CPU intense, sometimes it is memory intense, sometimes it is both. Therefore, this discussion, which just some right now, is very relevant in this domain as I have access to computational resources. Am I looking for more memory or more CPU power? What do I mean by that? Sometimes I understand that my task can be broken down to several tasks. So instead of running one task at a time, I can run many at the same time. And once they are done, I can move to the next step. Imagine you have a group of you, and as you are working on the project now, where each one is going to get a task and work very efficiently. It is uh, very safe in the space of CPUs. If you have four cores to say, four are working effic very efficiently. Because when I say the team, you may say, well, three of the four members have been working very efficiently, the fourth one not, half and half, okay? But again, CPU space? No, it's here to serve us. So how many cores do we have there and the resources they dedicate to us? And it depends on the problem. Can we really break it down and solve it in, uh, in parallel? Meaning, can we go and say, well, let's, let's you know, let's uh, 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 write the code, take the most intense or time-consuming part and make it parallel, okay? This is one thing. The other thing that we are, uh, sometimes that we need to look into is memory. And why do we need uh, lots of memory sometimes? Uh, memory is needed if I need to read lots of data and see it at the same time. Imagine you are solving a puzzle, right? We looked into, uh, do you know, uh, we looked into solving the alignment puzzle before. Uh, this alignment puzzle that we looked into required me to see some, the all pieces together, okay? So certainly to make the best decision, if I need or end up reading or require the need to read everything first and keep an eye on everything, this may mean that, oh, I would need to bring everything to the memory. Because in the computer architecture, we have the hard drive, okay, the hard drive. This could be, you know, the regular mechanical hard drive. It could be the SSD solid state drives and so on and so forth. It's where you uh, store your data permanently. Data is here and SSDs, for example, if it happens, you have, uh, you know, now I think most of the recent uh, uh, laptops are having SSDs. So you can store lots of data there, but again, it's not the fastest way to process data. The fastest way is to bring it the memory, and we refer to this as random access memory. Now, this is random access in the sense that I'm not gonna go there necessarily in a sequ sequential manner as happens on the hard drive. Uh, and it is allocated randomly, meaning if I write a piece of data into one location with one address, remember the mailbox example, and this is another one piece of data that I write, this is the third one, third piece of data. It may be the case that again, somebody else is gonna have come in the future and then jump into this area, take over this one. So I assign now a new data. So it's, this is not sequential. I've jumped in the middle of a previously two written uh, pieces of data. I've wiped the, one, wiped the one in the middle, I wrote a new data. So this is the type of random access memory. Uh, it is very efficient to access because we do t table lock lookups. Think again about the hash tables that we had. But it is limited. And everything uh, limited in this universe means it has some value, some cost, right? Uh, and when we put these things together, which is, you know, CPU and memory, 
it means I'm having these computational resources. And again, when you go to discovery cluster, for example, or any type of cluster, you may define that you need more CPUs, more cores, okay? I know my task can be uh, uh, designed to be parallel by simply breaking it down into parallel components, okay? There are different ways and examples that one can think of. In general, any type of problem that we can break it down into different pieces where we can solve each separately and they are independent, then let's break it down. Basically, it's a matter of saying my for loop, it is my way of iterating over uh, items in my data set can be in parallel. So instead of accessing one, access 10 at the same time and do 10 processing. So what if, if I tell you I have access to four cores or 40 cores. 40 cores would mean it's going to be much, much faster than four cores, and so on and so forth. Now, with regard to the memory, what if I tell you you have access to eight gigabyte as compared to one terabyte of memory? Okay, now some of these numbers might be unbelievable to some of you. Like, do we have one terabyte memory? Do we have machines with 96 cores? or more, my machine is just four cores and eight gigabytes, I'm happy with it, or 16 gigabytes and eight cores, I'm happy with it. But guess what? For some problems, you need to jump to these numbers, which are hard to design at the level of your laptop. That is what's gonna define for us high performance computing, high, high performance computing, okay? Very well. So in terms of a definition, HPC systems deliver, of course, exceptional computational power. They can handle lots of computations, intense tasks, and beyond. Uh, high performance computing is a concept. Uh, when we recognize this as a specific set of hardware, uh, hardware, we need to know the details, like the specs uh, of the uh, system. Um, usually, uh, countries are sharing the specs of their supercomputers. There is an international world ranking of, uh, you know, top high uh, HPC systems. Also, there are systems that are accessible at the level of universities and labs. And again, these systems can be used for many, many purposes. Bioinformatics is one of the fields that where if I would end up saying, well, I'm going to establish a bioinformatics lab, there's no way but to say that I need computational resources. I need my own cluster or very powerful servers. Why? Of course, how I'm going to end up doing some basic tasks like alignment and assembly if I don't have powerful resources. Okay, so if it happens to be that you want to contribute to your own place where you want to build some more computational power by running some bioinformatics software or programs, you may pretty much end up figuring out what's the budget that can be allocated for hardware that you can bring, and, or renting some resources, like from the cloud, we will come to this, okay, or collaborate with some other labs that can give you access to such information. In the universe of HPC computing, we can look into some terms like a node. And what you see in front of you is, um, is, is one of the nodes, okay? Uh, you can think of this node as one computer, okay? So one may ask, what is this? One, some of you may think that this is the full cluster. Usually it's not. Okay, some of you may think this is the whole data center. It is not. This is, this is, and in our understanding, it is one computer, okay? The term that we use usually is compute node. This is one compute node, okay? These are the hard drives, you see? So you can count here, three, six, nine, 12. You have around 12 hard drives. 
Okay, could be solid state drives or whatever. Here we may have two CPUs, not one. Something also some of us are not used to see in their own personal machines. This is not anymore just a personal machine. Although you might be, you know, lucky enough to be responsible for some nodes and use it. So you may have two CPUs at this specific node. You have circuits with, you know, these are the PCI boards. And so that's going to maintain data exchange between the different parts in high efficiency. You may have network Ethernet cables here that can accept up to 10 gigabytes of data flow per second and so on and so forth. This is usually customized. You can look into such nodes ranging from a few thousand dollars up to ten thousand dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. I had dealt with purchase of a single node, which is around fifty thousand. I would say in terms of US dollars, I'm gonna say this is gonna be around forty thousand dollars. Okay, so this is one node. And you may design it because you can add memory chips here as much as you can, okay, to reflect on and memory processing. So this is one node and we can add additional nodes like the login node and the management node. You might remember our tutorial on discovery and that when you access, you are on the login nodes and that you shouldn't do any processing there. So in cluster environment, we usually have the user accessing through their own personal resources, right? And then we go to login node. Now the login node, what is nice about login node is it's gonna have certain requirements, like it's gonna offer me operating system similar to the ones here. It's going to offer me a chance to run a program here and then distribute it over these nodes. So login node it takes me already very close enough to the space of these compute nodes. A group of them is going to make what, what is called a cluster. So discovery cluster is having a group of compute nodes. On that system, we may have a dedicated server to do specific tasks like file server we could have end up having just a storage space while each one have its, has its own storage we may have a shared storage as well and so on and so forth in terms of a topology and a topology here is a network concept it is how we make the arrangement of the different computers so imagine we are two in one room and we want to play against each other and we couldn't have an internet access to play the game. In fact, years ago, this used to be the case. I still remember the story where I've met my, I was in my uh, roommate in campus, in dorms, and we wanted to play uh, FIFA on computers. He had his own personal, I had my own personal computer. Well, we couldn't, we didn't have internet. Uh, uh, well, we had internet, but we couldn't have access to the game through internet. Nowadays, this is the way you play games, like video games through, you know, PlayStation, Xbox, and so on and so forth. So what did we do? We built a network. We brought an ethernet cable and we basically connected both computers to each other. So back and forth, we're going to have this flow of data in both directions, so we play it against each other. Now, when it comes to high-performance computing, it means we have lots of nodes. <laughs> How are we going to do it? You can think of all possible ways, and they are all possible ways. You may think, I'm going to link this to this to this in that sequential manner. You may think to connect everything to each other, everything to each other and keep going. You may think, well, let me categorize or group those into a tree structure. That is, that is with certain specifics, that's what brings us to fat tree topology. 
And basically, if I have, this is a tree topology. And it's fat tree because the bandwidth here at this first layer is higher than the bandwidth here on the second layer is higher than the bandwidth at this third layer and so on and so forth. You see the thickness changes uh, indicating the differences in bandwidth. This is more of suitable high performance computing topology. InfiniBand, uh, of course, one thing to comment on uh, fat tree topology, it can be more expensive than other topologies. Why? Because for higher switches, every time we need to put up computer here, we are establishing a switch to say the data goes to uh, where. Every time uh, <clears throat> sorry. Okay. So at this higher level, we need higher bandwidth switches. Again, the um, again the thickness and the line that I've sketched. But in terms of performance, it is certainly going to bring lots of scalability as compared to other ways to doing it. Doing it. InfiniBand is a high performance and low latency interconnect technology that is used in HPC or high performance clusters. OK, it's a way of having a fabric layer. It, it's going to interconnect things like different components within a system like CPUs, memory, and I.O. devices. Okay, so this is generally, when we say InfiniBad, we are referring to InfiniBad about the devices, the way the devices are interconnected. Okay. So, when two devices are connected directly without any switches, this would give an example of simplest InfiniBand topology. Now, I understand I didn't explain a switch in detail, but you can think of a switch as something that keeps moving as data comes flowing, and then where should we send this? Up or down, for example. Okay. When the core switch is going to take an extra effort or mean time to do the processing. An infinite band case, we are not doing well, in, especially with the type what's called point to point, we are having no switches. However, there is the single switch infinite band when we have one switch. Factory itself, that we have just described, that is hierarchical. In the context of any ba infinite band, so if it is factory, if I have a factory topology, and infinite band at the, at the same time, this means that we are interconnecting switches and nodes in such a way as we move up the tree in hierarchy, the bandwidth is increasing, and so on and so forth. So infinite band in general as topology refers to the arrangement and interconnection of nodes and switches. It could be different types of topologies. It could be a free fat tree topology. And then we have shared memory space. So we can have many computers looking at the same shared memory space. Sometimes we establish a virtual memory or a virtual supercomputer as we work with what's called grid computing that are geographically distributed systems or resources. So the computers to have a high performance computing resource don't, doesn't need to be in the same place. They could be geographically distant. Meaning we can do our own network, all of us, and then do some higher performance computing. But again, is that the best or not? Subject to the case that we have. And then, of course, cloud computing means we're accessing the cloud resources uh, that is 
the software, both the software arrangement of and management of resources and makes it easy for us to go and host data through uh, online resources and run our programs there. As I referred before, when we are linking multiple computers together, together we are going to build of what is called a cluster. Okay, think of cluster as one that is made of uh, a few uh, interconnected uh, compute nodes and so on and so forth. This is a nice uh, uh, photo from a data center. Never got the chance to access such uh, amazing looking uh, data center. We'll see later on the presentation, a snapshot from the Facebook one. You may look online for the Google one. I went to some university data centers. Well, I like to be there sometime, okay? Because this is one of the things I'm going to also mention later. Not anyone can access data centers. This is a place that you cannot ac access unless you have high security and privilege. Because anything that can go wrong there, we're not going to talk about pennies, but millions of dollars. So let's dive more into high performance computing characteristics. High performance computing, guys, means I want to push for more parallel processing. I want to push more for using resources. I want to speed up. I don't want to run a bioinformatics task that's going to go for days. I want to execute a task in a matter of few hours. So, as I said before or earlier, some tasks are one that we can do in serial manner. So I need to finish one step and then I can go back to the previous step. Multi-threaded case is when I can divide the task, I can break it into a group of tasks, and then I have to wait and put a barrier where I accumulate all results, and then I can go back to the next step. However, there is multi-threaded and parallel where I don't need to wait. So this one can come here, finish, okay? And directly, it can jump to the next one. This one comes here, and directly it jumps and gives the results. So we can keep breaking down the problem. There are different ways into how we can, uh, you know, design an algorithm in this case and better reflect uh, a parallel way of solving the problem. Okay. Um, let me check something here. So, well, I don't want to dive into uh, maybe specific technical things, but I want to mention uh, something here for us, okay? Usually, uh, we're looking into uh, four uh, loops, okay? Four loops. And um, if I have, for example, an array of numbers, okay, and you can think here we have one number, sorry, x2, x3, mm -hmm. up to xn. So I may write for i in, you know, range 0 up to length, well, let's say up to n. Let's make it easy here. And what do we want to do with this? Well, I want to go over all of these elements. Okay. Now, the, I'm going to show you just quickly, just a natural two ideas. Maybe I'm looking for the maximum number. Maybe I'm looking to check which ones are even or odd. Okay. Two examples. Maximum. I need to go through the whole array and compare. So my max now is going to equal minus infinity. And as I go through this array, well, I would say array number of numbers at position i. And if it is greater than e max, 
then my max is going to equal this number. OK. So in this case, my for loop requires to go through all numbers, right? Now, if I parallelize this, I'm going to end up checking everyone with the same maximum. So this seems to be a sequential case. Unless I redesign the algorithm and say, well, take the first three and get the maximum and call it max A, and take the second one and call it max B. OK, so then divide the problem into chunks and each time run the max and then compare the maximum of each with each other. Maybe then I can gain uh, enhanced performance in terms of parallel. However, this is not like even or odd problem. Even or odd problem in this case is, well, I'm going to check if this is modulus over operation over two is going to equal zero. So this is going to mean even. In fact, all what I need here now to say is let's have it's an array number. OK, let's say even. Uh, even. Array. OK. And then this is going to be Boolean. So if array number I modulus two equals zero, then even. Array. At position I remember now this is different thing than the maximum problem is going to be. Even I'm going to write even here. Else. Even array. Going to equal if it is Boolean can be false, can be zero. I can put here one and here zero or even an odd. So now I can run this in parallel, and so I can come here and say, well. Make it. Parallel. What does it mean? We'll take each iteration and run it in parallel. Give it to one. I have here four cores, so give I1 to this core, I2 to this core, I3 to this core, I4 to this core. And this is perfectly independent task for the different iteration. OK, now some of you may say, what? Make it parallel. This is not how we do it. Well, uh, it is sort of what we do. If you have a perfectly what we call embarrassingly parallel, something easy to parallel by just because of the design nature of the problem, you will basically put some directions here. OK, some instructions for the code, depending on the compiler and how we do it and using what framework. Usually we're using what's called OpenMP or MPI and so on and so forth frameworks. And then this whole thing is going to be running in parallel. You don't actually need to tell the CPU and you don't need to dive into this and say go here and go there. Something would, uh, else would take care of this. But what does this teach you? is that depending on the nature of problem, remember the max problem needs, the numbers are dependent. I need to check some numbers. Still, I can break it down, but I need to sort it out. As compared to even or odd, which is individual for each item, it is perfectly parallel. And so thinking about the algorithm we have would really bring our to our attention what we can do and what is the best way to design a solution. There are many, and in relation to that, there are different software uh, frameworks into how we can distribute our tasks and combine them together. There is Apache Hadoop and Apache Spark. The cool thing about these frameworks, for example, and there are many others, is that you can download them and install them in your own cluster. And then you don't need to worry anymore about if you have 10 computers or 100 computing nodes. What you do, you write your code, and then that code you give instructions that you, I'm using Spark, Apache Spark, you are using it, and then you are basically calling the algorithms already implemented in Spark. What's cool in Hadoop and Spark is two things. First of all, they give you accessible architecture as a software layer, so you, can, you don't need to worry about managing resources. 
they give you already good implementation, so you can easily, through documentation or resources or existing implementations, use very fa uh, powerful algorithms that depend on these architectures, or you can write your own using their own frameworks. One of the things that we uh, consider when we are looking into the high performance computing world and the cloud computing and so on and so forth, am I making server two as busy as server one? This is gonna take us to the example when I was talking about the teammates. Are we all working sufficiently, uh, uh, you know, um, in terms of uh, the time spent, the effort. So this is when I said, you know, CPUs and cores are expected, are expected to run all the time and efficiently. Is it always the case? Maybe not, especially when it comes to be more complicated in high performance computing when we have more mini nodes. That's the issue of load balance. Are all team members working equally? or some are working, you know, more intense on this, and some, you know, you're a little bit lazy, maybe they are busy with things, and some are like, you know, trying to support the leader a little bit, and some know are very hard working on this, okay? So this is an issue that, of course, needs consideration in this distributed environment, and one needs to look specifically into how to enhance this. Some of the interesting ideas is what's called Illumina's Dragon, okay? This is, when we understand this, somebody would come up with the question, why I don't develop a specific hardware for my own problem? If we know these ideas, well, this is already there. And of course the floor is open, especially through what's called FPGA or field programmable gate array. This is an area of computer engineering where you can go and get a circuit and actually, uh, optimize that circuit for specific computations. And this is what has been done in Illumina's Dragon, which is for dynamic read analysis. Dynamic read analysis uh, for genomics. This is the word Dragon for genomics. Dynamic read analysis for genomics. So it's using GPUs, these powerful uh, graphics units, field programmable arrays, all of these together to do what? to leverage parallel processing to analyze multiple samples simultaneously for doing different tasks like variant calling, mapping, and data quality control. It's such an amazing hardware, piece of hardware, okay, that allows for an integrated workflow. Think about this accelerator kind of, you know, this is not just a CPU for game, video gamers. You know what? We buy information, we have our own CPU. It sounds interesting and cool to uh, say. Illumina Nova 6000 6, is a high throughput sequencing platform developed by Illumina. So this type of sequencing system is designed to perform whole genome sequencing very efficiently, but it can generate up to six terabytes, or actually it can generate up to six terabytes, yes, of data and 20 billion, 20 billion single reads. Wow. It can be configured, in fact, to sequence up to 48 genomes in approximately two days. 48 genomes in approximately two days. So imagine these numbers. Imagine the speed that one can gain to do the processing. This is huge. But then we need high PC, HPC systems. It's going to give me high storage. When you go to HP systems, you can store lots of data. If you don't have access to these resources, why would you buy such a machine? Of course, you need high performance computing. Illumina's Dragon also comes with its own software to perform analytics, as I mentioned earlier, read mapping, variant calling, and data uh, and uh, data compression, and so on and so forth. So when it comes to high performance computing, we have many computers. 
And as I say, different bioinformatics projects may require different ways of handling. Sometimes you may want higher memory, like assembly. Usually we need more memory in assembly, okay, uh, as compared to other tasks, uh, like searching and alignment, it's going to be more CPUs and so on and so forth. Sometimes we need both. Uh, depending on the algorithm, as I've shown you an example, the max min, you know, is very basic, simple, but I hope it delivers the idea. And as, as a max example, min example, and odd or even for each number, and so on and so forth. Uh, so scaling up with the resources is very important for us. So the network that we build in the high performance computing world, the ways we link things together, shouldn't act as a bottleneck for us. So is I, if I bring fancy nodes, like I can go to the data center and they're not able to offer me good ethernet cables to link everything eventually to the, uh, you know, to other nodes, to the internet, it's gonna be then not that efficient. And even inside this compute node, what about to the, up to the level of PCI, the copper cable assemblies, whatever we have there, how much of bandwidth are gained through these circuits is very important. So usually somebody with an expertise in hardware need to be involved before you get some of these servers. In fact, if you go and meet with uh, any of the vendors, they will start always asking you, what do you need it for? And then they'll start making recommendations for the specific hardware. So, uh, collaboration is always there. Many of the institutions, the universities have their own uh, data centers, clusters dedicated for genomics and bioinformatics. And there are many collaborations. In fact, this is one of the reasons why there are collaborations out there. Maybe in my university, which is a small one, I don't have access to a supercomputer or a cluster, so I collaborate with another friend where they can, uh, you know, arrange for me such access, and then we both work on some research problem. There are many resources that are commonly used in HP systems, coming from different vendors or referring to different technologies, such the platform, such as the platforms you see here, SGI UV3000, for example. It's a shared memory supercomputer, so it offers lots, a lot large amounts and lots of memory. As I said, the novo genome assembly is one of the things that one would think about using such machines. It uses Intel Xeon processors, very powerful processors. It is scalable to tens of terabytes of global shared memory. There is also Craze X-series super, supercomputers. It is a distributed memory supercomputer. It uses both CPUs and GPUs. It, it is designed to scale out to hundreds and thousands of cores, okay? IPM power systems, and this is uh, built on what's called power architecture. Uh, it is tailored to leverage GPUs and CPUs. It allows advanced reliability, availability, and serviceability. That is IPM power systems. Microsoft Azure and other ones, it is a cloud-based uh, HPC. So through the cloud, you can access. There is Microsoft Azure. We have Google Cloud. We have Amazon Web Services. Personally, I use some of these cloud services to perform uh, you know, some of the advanced computing for which I don't have the regular commodity computers like our personal computers useful for. There are more examples that you see from NVIDIA, Think Systems, and Bluebe, and so on and so forth. So, one of the things that comes to mind sometimes, what about hosting my own computer system? We need to know that these are very, not expensive, they are beyond expensive, okay? As I said, one node can, like a decent node, I'm not even talking about, uh, you know, uh, and like uh, uh, something that is surprising in the field of HPC, you can end up ha paying 50K 
So imagine I have a rack of those, which is going to be five or of those. So I end up with quarter a million dollar. So pretty much the number grows for millions of dollars for clusters, and big data centers or supercomputers. Not only this, uh, this comes with lots of management. We need lots of power, power supplies. What if the electricity goes down? We need backup plans, backup for data, backup generators, recovery systems, and cooling those hardware is not an easy thing to manage. Okay. Sometimes when you host your data in the cloud, the systems are made such a way if there is a natural disaster in one country or geographical region, there is a duplicate of that data in another geographical region. And as I said earlier, it's not easy to access these places. They have usually high strict measures. One of the biggest challenges for data centers is keeping temperature low and controlling that temperature. So liquid cooling systems and different types like two phase immersion cooling solutions is one of the interesting ideas where liquid is being used. Now, if it happens you are a fan of building your computer, and here comes my first treasure hunt question for the day, is first, actually I'm going to ask you a few at this stage. So let me know, have, other than discovery, have you had any chance to work with any um, high performance computing resource like a cluster in your own work or with a collaborator? Uh, and also, if no, but do you have in your workplace uh, any HPC resources? And if you're not working, you know, uh, ever did you have the chance to recognize or hear about another cluster in your university or in your own uh, company or anywhere other than the discovery system that we're looking at? Uh, my last question here, have you ever built your own PC or desktop or thought about it? I know many did not do it, but maybe many thought about it. So maybe, and if you want to do it, I want you to share with me what kind of cooling system would you like to have? I'm not going to give you the answer here. The reason is I want you to go and search online, see some fancy or some fun furs to look at cooling systems, especially the ones with LEDs. So you can see some fans, some um, liquid nitrogen things based and so on and so forth. Sh share with me which one you prefer. This is from Meta Facebook Data Center. All right, it looks nice again to be there. And as I discussed earlier on discovery cluster that we have, there are different partitions onto you where you can have your data. There is the home one, which is your own, uh, you know, user uh, path and your own user folder. This is 50 gigabyte only, not a lot of data. We have access to the scratch. And yes, I have highlighted this during that tutorial, but anyway, this is can store up to 1.8 petabyte of data, which is huge, but be careful. Everything that stays for 28 day is gonna be purged because these storage spaces are not infinite. They are finite. Now we have the course uh, partition, which can allow us up to one terabytes, so you are recommended to store data there for your own project. I'm going to uh, stop here and then continue in the second part.